chapter number 1 and verse number 9. 1 Peter 1, 9. All right, 1 Peter 1, 9, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Note especially what we're going to read next. Which things the angels desire to look into. Father, bless this book tonight now. Thy holy name, amen. You can be seated. The Apostle Peter just told you that the prophets prophesied. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. They spake as the Holy Ghost moved them. It doesn't mean that they, could, that they had to understand a thing they said. Inspiration doesn't mean it comes from man's wisdom or a man's ability. It's God breathed. So God gave them the word to write. But notice carefully the dispensational aspect to this thing. There's no denying it. Verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things. So when you pick the scriptures up and you begin to read them from Genesis through Revelation, you need to ask yourself a question. Who's this talking to? Who's it talking to? That's question number one. And question number two, uh, what doctrinal application is this in my life? And question number three, what about a spiritual application? Is a lesson here that I need to learn? And so the Word of God being alive, quick, and powerful, you need to approach it in that manner because even though on the surface of it, it may not appear to have anything for you, you'd be surprised once you read it. But I'm going to call your attention to the fact that the angels desired to look into this salvation. Now we're going to read just a little bit about what the New Testament says about these angels and see if we can't put something together. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Acts chapter 7. And verse number 53, Acts chapter 7 and verse number 53, Acts 7, 53. The scripture says, who have received the law by what? The disposition of angels and have not kept it. So the giving of the law at Sinai in one way or another was connected with angels. This is what the scripture says. Now, Go with me to the book of Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 19. Galatians 3, 19. Book of Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Here we have the law, reference to the law again, and a little more is revealed to us, and that is that uh, there was a promised seed that was going to come. And this may very well point directly to what the Apostle Peter is talking about when he says they desired to look into these things, these angels did. But this is what's important. Notice that when the law came, the scripture says that angels were involved in it in one fashion, one manner, or another. And notice carefully, it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, of course, a mediator is a go-between. It's one that goes between two parties. Now, this is important. Look at Hebrews chapter number 2 and verse number 2. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse number 2. The scripture says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to men and was confirmed unto us 
by them that heard him. Now notice the references to angels. They keep popping up here. Look at Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 38. And keep in mind, we're talking about the first covenant. Acts chapter number 7 and verse number 38. Acts 7, 38 says, This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. Here's the angel again. See that? And then in verse number 35, Acts chapter number 7, This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Now, how many of you remember the, the confrontation or the, con, or the conversation, that's the best way, uh, of Moses with someone at the bush? Do you remember that? All right, who was he talking to? He was talking to the Lord. All right, here's made just simply called an angel. Now, remember, I've, I've, I've mentioned this to you so many times before. The word angel could be a created spirit being that is an angel. But the word angel could also refer to the angel of the Lord. The Old Testament, we would call it a Christophany or a theophany. In other words, a physical manifestation or an appearance of God in angelic form before he was incarnate as a man. But the word angel even goes further than that. When the scripture talks about the children and their angel doth behold the face of our Father which is in heaven. Well, what is that? The angel of a child. Then when Peter uh, had uh, been released from the prison, the angel opened the door, moved, the, moved it back and allowed him to come out. And Rhoda went to the door and there stood Peter. Then uh, when she told them Peter was at the door, they said, well, you, you messed up. It must be his angel. And so we have to take it from that to mean one of a couple of things. Either it is an appearance of Peter in angelic form, in spirit form, as an angel, or an angel has taken upon himself to appear as a representative or in the place of Peter. I tend to believe that we have an angelic essence because an angel, angel is a manifestation like the Lord God in the Old Testament. And you've got to think about this. Now, I'm not saying you are an angel. I'm trying to get it across in the use of the word. Does the Bible say that be careful that you could entertain angels unawares, right? And so you're entertaining someone who appears to be a human, a man or a woman, and yet they're not. An angel in the essence of a created spirit being is not a man. It's not a woman. It's an angel. The Greek word for it is angelos, and it's one sent, sent with a message, sent as a messenger, sent as a representative. But to try to understand it a little better, I think the angel of the Lord would help us. Because the Lord Jesus Christ appeared in the Old Testament. He appeared many times in the Old Testament. And here the apostle just simply says angel. But this is before he was incarnate. This is before he became a man. This is before God became man. Now, this is not part of God that became a man. No, no. This is God became a man. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Now, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 15, God is invisible. He's an invisible being. You can't see him with the eye. So therefore he appears in human form. But it did not happen there. He did not appear in human form in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a human. Now that's the difference. This is not a phantom or an illusion or like the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. This is a literal physical man. And he was God. So... When the Bible says in the Old Testament that this covenant, this first covenant, was, uh, was ministered, brought into being, ratified, given power through means of an angel, you do the research on it and you really can't find any, any specific or particular place where this happened 
although you have allusions to it that brings you about what's going on here, but you've got to keep in mind what we're talking about with angel. Some of this tonight that I'm going to give you is not going to necessarily be right to the point, but that's okay. It make you think, and the whole point is thinking. So when God brought into existence his commandments by writing in stone with his finger, and this was, uh, this was the law of God given at Sinai. Angels were involved somehow or another in bringing that into ratification. In other words, power, authority, in essence, into being. And the angel was there. But now when you come to the New Testament, you come to the New Covenant. We're talking about the Old Covenant first, the blood of bulls and goats. And the apostle says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. In the Old Testament saint, his sins were forgiven. They were forgiven. They were forgiven based upon the grace of God and the mercy of God. But they were not taken away. It was not until the Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross at the prophecy of John the Baptist who said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He took it away. He became absolute Lord, God, and Master over sin. Now, do you understand that? Yes, sir. Not in any superficial, part, half-done way. What he did, he did completely. And nothing can be added to it. In plain words, as it relates to sin, the sacrifice of Christ upon that cross cannot be improved. It cannot be added to. And cannot, you cannot detract from it. He finished the job. Now, whether we understand completely and fully all that was involved in that, it's a different story entirely. But according to the book of Hebrews chapter number 9, turn there with me tonight. Hebrews chapter number 9. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the what? The death. Not the promise. No, not the typology. And promises and typologies, they're all fine. But what we're talking about here tonight, there must be of necessity the death of the testifer, testator. Now look at verse 17. A testament is of force when? After men are dead. All right. Is there a big difference between the old covenant and the new covenant? Bigger than words can describe. Bigger than words can define. You better believe it. Because the Old Covenant was built upon law written in stone, not in the hearts of men. And the Old Covenant was built upon the blood of bulls and goats. And the priesthood of the Old Testament was the priesthood of Aaron by men who were sinners standing before a holy God. The New Covenant is a covenant of the blood of God himself, Acts 20, verse 28. And there is nothing greater than his blood. And that blood, the Lord Jesus said this about. I want you to look at it with me now. Let me see if I can find my reference. He said this about his blood. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. Luke chapter 22, verse 20. All right, let's see if I got my text right. Yeah, here we are. All right, verse 19. He took the bread and gave thanks, break it and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new testament, hakene diatheke, this is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now hold on just a moment. Let's put our thinking cap back on a moment. Was this blood that he's talking about here, was it in force? Was it in power? No, no, no. This is, a, this is a prophecy and a promise. That blood, until he died on the cross, see, the death of the testator. This is the new covenant, the New Testament in my blood. So obviously, the Lord Jesus Christ did not see that wine as his blood. He was using it as a figure. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth save us, not the washing away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a clear conscience to God. A figure, see. So what we have here now is a covenant, a covenant that, is, that will be ratified when Christ said it's finished. 
to telestai. It's done. It's finished. It's complete. It's accomplished. It could not be added to, and there's where it came into force. When he bowed his head and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he did. There on the cross. And he laid the foundation for the new covenant. When he was raised from the dead three days later, he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. God, one more time, declared him to be his son by the resurrection from the dead. Now, where's the angel? Angels have absolutely nothing to do with the new covenant. Now, let that settle in. Think about that for a moment. Nothing. In the Old Testament, the reason the angel could be involved is because it was not between God and the spirit of a man. There was nothing in the Old Testament covenant that could change a man's spirit. The spirit must be born again. Nicodemus, you must be born again. Was Nicodemus a lover of God? Was he an observer of the law? Certainly he was, no hypocrite. Nicodemus was following the light he had, doing what he could with what he had. He said, we know thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do the things you do, except God be with him. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then, of course, the argument, how can I enter the second time my mother's womb? Nicodemus, art, art thou a master in Israel, and knoweth not these things? There's some things that I've given to you many times before, and I'll just give you five of them quickly tonight, and we'll move along. We are made in the image of God. We've been created in God's image. What is that image? That's a good question. Because you have God's body showing up when the Lord Jesus Christ appeared. You said, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. Well, this is the Father. The Father, the Father in flesh. God in flesh. I mean, can you separate the Father from the Son and from the Holy Ghost? No, no, no. You can't. Don't chop them up, folks. Now, I'm a believer in the Trinity, fully and completely. But you've got to remember, there is one God <laughs> and one mediator between God and men. Well, how do we understand that? If you understood the essence of a spirit being, then maybe we could get a hold of what's going on here. But we don't. So, here the Lord Jesus Christ appears. And here they see him. And they see him as he is 2,000 years ago. And here he is in flesh. And he has blood. And the blood that he shed, according to the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the blood of God. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood covenant. The blood testament. There's the same, they're the same, testament, covenant, same thing. It's just different as it relates to a time period with Israel. So same thing, blood covenant, all right? So this, first of all, we're made in the image of God. Secondly, man can pray, all right? You can pray. Remember, praying is far more than simply talking because I showed you in the book of Job, Job did a lot of talking. All of them talked, but the Bible says plainly at the end, then he prayed for his accusers. See, calling attention to it. There's not a word in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation ever says a cherubim or a seraphim or an angel prays. Is it because they're incapable of prayer? Is it because of their spiritual makeup they can't? Or simply maybe they can, but the Bible doesn't say they can. You see, I mean, I've said it and I've... My neck's on the chop block, and I've said it many times, but nobody has come to me yet to show me where an angel or anything apart from a man can pray. And the third thing is the new birth. We're born of the Spirit of God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say an angel, cherubim, seraphim, watcher, or any of them are born again. But we are born of God. See, born from above. The fourth one is fellowship. Koinonia, we spent some time in 1 John talking about fellowship, truly our fellowship with the Father, and, and got into the details of it and how the confession is what goes on inside the soul. If you say you have not sinned, you deceive yourselves. If you, if you say you have no sin, you call God a liar. So it gets, it gets pretty personal with it. But he said if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you, cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Therefore we have fellowship with the Father and with the Son and the Holy Ghost. But there's not a word in the Bible that says an angel, cherubim, seraphim, or any of them have fellowship. I'm not saying they don't. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is you won't find it 
in Scripture. And then finally, that ability to love. We can love him. That's the basis of fellowship. To whom much is forgiven, the same what? Loveth much. And so we love him. And if you know him, you love him. And, and I, I don't question, you know, I'm not, I'm not here to come between you and God. But you know in your heart and your soul tonight if you love the Lord. And you love him. All right? So here we are. This is, this is man. So why does the angel, why does he have no part in that new covenant? Well, look what Paul said over here. Turn with me in the book of uh, Colossians. Uh, let me see if I can find the text. I think it's about chapter number 2. I got so much scribble down here. I'm getting me some glasses that are thick. I'm going to knock the bottom out of some Coke bottles and see if I can. Let's see, Colossians 2.18. Let's look at this one. Colossians 2.18. Here's a warning. The apostle to the church at Colossae, 2.18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of what? Look at this. See the angels? Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Isn't that, one, isn't that remarkable? How that when an angel is mentioned as it relates to the gospel, New Testament, it's not in a good context. Look at Galatians 1.8. Galatians 1.8. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be anathema, let him be accursed. See that? That's not a good context. So two places angels are mentioned as it relates to the gospel of the grace of God, and it's not good. In plain words, God doesn't use angels to preach the gospel. He uses men. He uses men, and he uses men who love him and have recalled of him, anointed of him, faithful men, to preach the word of God. I suspect one of the reasons that angels have nothing to do with the New Testament or the new birth and the, and the, and the new covenant is the fact that when you're born, you're born of the Spirit, all right? And you've been made in the image of God. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, he came to renew and restore the lost image that Adam lost in the garden. Adam lost it. We had, a, we, had a, we had a reasonable facsimile of it, but it wasn't the same. And he said, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his, his blood be shed, for he's made in the image of God. So we still retained a certain amount of that in the sense that, uh, that we have that. Now, Here's the problem. The problem is when you get in to try to define the image of God. That's where you get in trouble. So why? I'm sure you've probably heard the word anthropomorphic. That's just a big word. It's the joining conjunction of two Greek words, anthropos and morphe. Morphe is form, structure. Anthropos is man. Okay? So it is, in other words, a man structure. In plain words, the hand of God moved in the Old Testament and did such and so. Does God really have a hand? We're talking about that spirit being who can be everywhere at the same time, who is omnipresent. Well, when he became a man, he had a hand. See? He was incarnate. In plain words, was the Lord Jesus Christ, God incarnate, in flesh, okay, was he a fleshly, visible representation of what God looks like as a spirit being? You have an answer to that? <laughs> That's the kind of thing to sit on the back porch and watch the butterflies and the, and the, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, lightning bugs and listen to your, to your woodpecker. I got up this morning, went out there, and I saw something in the corner of the yard over there. I said, That's big. And I got my flashlight and I looked down at it and there's a beautiful doe standing down there. And she looked back up at me like that. You know? the big ears sticking straight up. That, uh, the light bouncing off the back of her eyeball. 
And those two eyes just lit up in the dark and stood there for the longest. And, uh, and it's beautiful, just young doe. She was fully grown, though. And she just kept looking back up at me. And I said, I'm not going to hurt you. Let me get you something to eat. <laughs> she was eating some bush or something out there. And then she went on up to the side of the house, and then I sat down and was drinking my coffee, and all of a sudden, here she came, right around through the back, out into the woods, and you could hear her as she was going out through the woods. Where I live, if you hear twigs cracking, you got weight on it. <laughs> Squirrels don't crack t twigs, you know what I mean? And I heard them cracking as she went on out through the woods. Yeah, that's, that's what she is. That's what she is, beautiful creatures. As a matter of fact, these, these deer, you know, white-tailed deer, they're everywhere, all over the place. Uh, that's how God made them. That's what they are. I am what God made of me. I know the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. I know what he looks like in one sense. Now look at 1 John. No, yeah, 1 John. Look at 1 John in the book of Romans. Let's start with Romans 8, verse 23. I know I get kind of romantic and get talking about stuff and people said what difference does that make well it makes a lot of difference to me i mean i'm not out in the sticks that far and here we have a deer all right romans chapter number eight and uh, verse number 23 now look at this and not only they but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. Isn't that something? Now go back before that and look at verse 19. Let's go to verse 7, 18 rather. For I reckon sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed for them. Now look at this. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for what the manifestation of the sons of God see that's an appearing of them Bible says my life is hid with Christ in God but the Bible says the time is going to come when the man the sons of God are manifested so look at uh, look at this one I want you to see this one too uh, first John chapter number three 1 John 3, and I'm quoting, I know a lot of you folks, you study your Bible, you know exactly where I'm going. Verse number 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Well, that's good to know, isn't it? It's not a reward for the end of your life, it's a present possession. Amen. Beloved, now are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. See this? See this? But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Isn't that beautiful? Now, you remember a few years back I talked to you about CRISPR-Cas9. How many remember that? CRISPR-Cas9. All right. This is at the article that I read it in. It said designing children. So what they've done is to take this double helix, they go into the genetic structure, the DNA, and they're able through high technology to begin to manipulate it and form what they want to to bring forth the kind of children they want to. Uh, we want our children to have this, 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 and on it goes. And I don't know how far they progressed from there. I want you to think about this next thing. Not only do you have DNA and you have uh, that, you've also got artificial intelligence, all right? So what is this leading to? I'm going to try to show you. What is artificial intelligence? I've been scratching around, digging around with this thing now for some time, and I'm beginning to come to, the, come to the conclusion that what really makes artificial intelligence powerful is algorithms. Algorithms. I mean, we all have, no, most of you operate computers. I do, you know, day in and day out. And, but a computer is not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a much higher level. In other words, to be able to think like a sentient being, all right? Now think about this for a moment. I wonder if it could come to the point where the computer 
could write its own algorithms and got so smart that it can make its own without the need of a human being. Reckon that could happen? CRISPR-Cas9, artificial intelligence, and then aliens. The government has come out and said there are, hey, did you know that there are Harvard professors right now, Harvard professors, who are telling people that we have aliens living in our midst. Now, when they say alien, they're talking about uh, extraterrestrial from somewhere, somewhere. Uh, I have no problem with aliens, but I don't think they came from somewhere, somewhere. I think they're demonic beings, okay? They're spirit beings. I don't question that. <coughs> but what's all that for? I want to think about this. Satan said, I will be like the Most High. Will you? The Bible says, no man hath ever seen God. No man. Well, preacher, they saw him. In, no, they saw manifestations like the angel of the Lord and so forth. From what I gather from Scripture, nothing except the Son has ever seen that eternal being in his pure essence. Nothing, nothing, nothing. That includes Satan. And Satan knows that the man is unique. This is why he went after Adam. He hated him because Adam was something different that he'd ever seen before. So what's he going to do now? Well, he's gone after the image of God in man. And it would surprise me one bit that the greatest, his, his last effort will be to try to destroy the image of God in man. If he does that, it's over. It's over to try to destroy it. And I only gave you three. There may very well be more than that. Uh, you know, CERN supposed to Hadron Collider, where you, where you bring these particles together, and at that moment of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, where, they, where they smash each other, they, they want to see what happens. But one of their own said, uh, we don't know what's going to happen. We may open a door, and something may come through that door that we're totally unprepared for. So we don't know what's going on. I mean, you know, do you really believe what the government tells you? No, I don't. I don't believe it for a minute. I wonder sometimes if they believe what they say. <laughs> but the bottom line is that you live in a high-tech society. You really do. You ever wonder where all this transgender stuff's coming from? People in male, female, non-binary, all this stuff? The genders being attacked? It has to do with the essence of who you are as a human being. The essence of man. All right, now I'll close with this tonight. And I mentioned it to you the other day. Maurice Rawlings... I had the greatest respect for him. We had him here at the church. He's a cardiologist in Chattanooga. We had him here 35 years ago, whatever it was. Very <laughs> brilliant man. And uh, you know the story. Man was on a treadmill, had a heart attack, and, uh, and he was, started screaming, I'm in hell, I'm burning. And the doctor uh, pulled him back and eventually got saved. But that doctor was awakened. He went home, brushed off his Bible, began to read it, and he got right with God. And you can see his stuff on YouTube, Maurice Rawlings, cardiologist. All right? His life came back into his body. That's what's going on. His life left his body. All right? You can look at all the high-tech stuff you want to or anything you, you please. What you will see is the ability to measure the biological, the physical, and all that. I marvel at these guys that go into buildings, ghost hunters, and they've got a bzzz, and they're trying to find a ghost with this stuff. <laughs> Good night, man. <laughs> Give me a break. <laughs> Spirit beings don't answer to the same laws of physics that we do. No, they don't. No, they don't. They don't answer to it. I don't know where we are, but I believe we're close to the coming of the Lord. I don't know what's liable to spring up and come from nowhere and people be totally unprepared for it. Because there's going to be an image raised up in Revelation 13. That image is going to be the image of the beast. It'll have his mark, and the whole world will be required to worship him. And they're going to have all the technology in the world to do it, every bit of it. And the Bible says, he that letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. The Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, I believe that's who the letting is. Let's the old English way of stopping. That's what it means, to let and to hinder. 
The Holy Spirit is keeping the floodgates from flying wide open. But when the rapture comes to take the saints away, and that's the mystery that God told us, show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, he said, but we shall be changed. Shout up, come up hither, meet him in the clouds. Hallelujah to God. Hope you're ready to go because I can't grab you as I go up. I can't do a thing to help you. <laughs> Either you're going to be ready or not. But boy, I'll tell you right now, what could be better than that? But folks, when the church is gone, the Holy Spirit is not going to be the same as he was now. There, the floodgates will open. All hell breaks loose on this earth. And with it, all this. And this is why Daniel said in Daniel 12, knowledge shall increase. Artificial intelligence may be the thing. I don't know. But I just give that to you tonight as a, uh, you know, as a kind of an instructive thing. So what's the essence of life? God. That's the answer. If you want to know the essence of life, it's God. God is the essence of life. He is life. He has lived forever and will live forever. He had no beginning. He has no ending. He has no end. That's the essence of life. Our Lord Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So the spirit never died. It ascended to the presence of the Father. His body died and was laid in the tomb. His soul descended into the heart of the earth. And on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And God declared him to be the son of God. Soul came back into the body. Spirit descended down into the body. And their body, soul, and spirit, the Lord Jesus walked out of that tomb never to change again. Forever he will be who he is. And the time will come when all of creation will look at him and God will forever be God forever. God shall be all in all. And how that, what that means, I don't have an answer. You don't have, you can't, you don't have, I don't have answers to everything. But I'll tell you one thing. You have been blessed beyond measure. Amen. You blessed beyond measure. Here you sit tonight in the image of God. If you've been born again, the image of Christ is what you have been, have been re You've been born into, made anew into the image of Christ, which is the very image of God himself. Father, bless your word, and thank you for the time we've had in your house. Bless the dear folk, Lord. In your holy name, amen. I was